This is another of those videos that's inspired by the comments section. So I did a video a little while back on King's Cross Goods Yard. Something a few people pointed out that I hadn't mentioned was the time when a Harrier jump jet took off from there as part of a transatlantic air race. They were mostly correct about that. Actually, I got some footage for a video about the event back in October, but one way or another I didn't do anything with it until now. However, there is a small but significant correction I have to make. The event didn't take place at King's Cross, but at St Pancras. I know the tube thinks they're the same place, but shut up the tube. So let's talk about what happened. The event took place in 1969 and was the start of the Daily Mail transatlantic air race. The Daily Mail promoted the race to commemorate the 50th anniversary of John Alcock and Arthur Brown's pioneering flight from St John's in Newfoundland to Clifton in Connemara in Ireland. This was the first ever non-stop transatlantic flight. Of course, by 1969 transatlantic flight was commonplace, so the Daily Mail proposed something a bit more special. A race from the Post Office Tower in London, now the BT Tower of course, to the Empire State Building in New York, still the Empire State Building of course. The only specification for the trip was that part of it had to be carried out by air. Beyond this, the specifications were very open. You could travel by light aircraft, chartered business jet, even commercial flight. And the rest of the journey could be undertaken any way you liked. All in all, it had the potential to be a very wacky race. Entrants included racing driver Sterling Moss, holiday camp magnate Billy Butlin, athlete Mary Rand, TV personality Clement Freud and Prince Michael of Kent. John Alcock's niece, Anne, was one of the youngest participants at just 18 years of age. But it wasn't just celebrities and VIPs getting in on the action. The Royal Navy and the Royal Air Force also fielded teams, and this is where St Pancras comes in. The RAF's aircraft was a Hawker Siddeley Harrier, the pride of the Air Force. The pilot was squadron leader Tom Leckie Thompson, one of only three pilots authorised to fly the new aircraft. The RAF had a number of somewhat unfair advantages over the civilian competitors vis-a-vis -vis resources and the ability to cut through red tape. But then, they weren't entirely in it for the sport. The British government were very proud of the Harrier, so the race had a strong propaganda element. If the RAF could show that their new jet was the bee's knees, the cat's pyjamas and the dog's pyjamas as well, then that potentially meant export orders. Indeed, the governments of Britain and America were already in talks to sell them to the US Marines. It should be pointed out that the organisers did have a number of different categories of prizes on the grounds that top-of-the-line military aircraft piloted by experts with government backing were a dead cert to win. Just so we all know where we stand. That being said, things weren't plain sailing for the RAF boys. Nothing like this had ever been attempted in a Harrier. There were doubts over whether it would be possible to refuel in mid-air. The two jets chosen, XV741 and XV744, were specially modified to allow this, as well as being fitted with longer wingtips to increase stability and range. I don't know how that works, I don't know aeronautics at all. The site chosen for takeoff was St Pancras Coal Yard, which was disused by 1969. This was not only a short distance from the post office tower, but an ideal place to demonstrate the craft's vertical takeoff ability. Meanwhile, the fuel tankers that would accompany the Harrier would depart from RAF Wisley. At the last minute, a construction site was found near the tower from which helicopters could transport the team to their respective takeoff sites. On the 4th of May 1969, the race began at the top of the post office tower. The competitors rushed off to their waiting transportation. They went by motorbike, by helicopter, taxicab, speedboat, bicycle, even rowing boat. Anne Alcock was the first civilian to leave, bearing a letter from Postmaster General John Stonehouse. Leckie Thompson arrived at the site temporarily dubbed RAF St Pancras and leapt into XV741. Despite the yard being hosed down, his takeoff caused a massive cloud of coal dust to erupt all over the unfortunate spectators, including Tom's wife Judy, who had worn white for the occasion. Brian Harper of the Daily Mail sent a telegram to New York with the words, British Rail are proud to announce that the 1032 Harrier jet from St Pancras Station left on time. As a condition of the Board of Trade allowing the use of St Pancras, Leckie Thompson had to follow the railway lines out of London. 
I'd love to tell you about all the drama and daring do as he crossed the Atlantic, but unfortunately for this video, there was none. The plane performed perfectly, with the modifications resulting in an uncommonly stable flight. The aircraft was refuelled nine times en route, and Tom himself was refuelled with a picnic lunch of chicken and ginger beer halfway across. At New York, the authorities had been rather more accommodating than those in London, and arranged a landing area in Bristol Basin, where Leckie Thompson made a perfect landing by eye. From there, he was driven on a Harley-Davidson by an off-duty NYPD officer to the Empire State Building. At the viewing gallery, he claimed his victory with a total time of 6 hours, 11 minutes and 57 seconds. Other competitors had their own stories of the finish. Anne Alcock was heartbroken when a hold-up at customs meant she missed her connection at John F. Kennedy Airport. Meanwhile, businessman Ted Drury astounded onlookers when his team disembarked. 100 city gents in matching pinstripe suits, bowler hats and umbrellas. There was an odd coda to the race. Tom Leckie Thompson and backup pilot Graham Williams were basking in the glow of victory the following evening when they heard about the upcoming arrival of the QE2 in New York Harbour. The pilots decided to put on a little show entirely without authorization. When the QE2 arrived, it was flanked by XV741 and 744. You might expect such a departure from protocol to be met with disapproval, but not only did the pilots get away with it, but they were later informed that an air marshal in New York had stolen the credit for the idea. Both aircraft would later be preserved, 744 at Tangmere and 741 at Brooklands. Not only was the race a great success for the RAF, but for Hawker Sidley and the British government. The aircraft created quite a stir on its arrival, and the performance meant that the US government had no hesitation in putting in an order for the Marine Corps. I guess you could say the RAF managed to... sell it to the Marines. Well, I hope you enjoyed this supersonic video. If so, you may wish to jet off to the like button and maybe land on the subscribe button for more flighty content. As always, I'd like to thank my generous donors on Ko-fi and Patreon. You are the Hawker Sidley Harrier to my Tom Leckie Thompson. I suppose I should also thank the commenters on my King's Cross video for getting me off my backside to actually make this video after, what, nine months? Anyway, let's hope it doesn't take me that long to make the next video. I'll see you again for that. Cheerio!